The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Starring Robert Cummings. Tonight's DuPont play is called Decision in the... In An Hour of Danger, Dr. Hunter McGuire, surgeon in the Confederate Army of Stonewall Jackson, made a fateful decision. Listen now as Robert Cummings on the DuPont Cavalcade tells you the dramatic outcome of Dr. McGuire's heroic choice. The year was 1862. We lay sleeping on the Virginia ground, the exhausted, battle-smeared army of General Stonewall Jackson. Have you ever been roused out of the blackness of numbness? They came to my hospital tent to rouse me. Two men, the sentry and the messenger. Dr. McGuire. Dr. McGuire, sir. Wake up, Dr. McGuire. Mm. Wake up, sir. Mm. Someone here for you. Oh, all right. All right, all right, Carl. Get the patient in the hospital tent. Lay him out on the table. Clean my knives. Get some more bandage. Dr. McGuire? Hmm? You... Well, you're not a patient, are you? I've come from Winchester, Dr. McGuire. Winchester's in Yankee hands. Yes, it is, sir. I've been nearly two days getting through the Yankee lines. I got... Bad news, Doctor. Bad news about Gert? Yes, sir. I was told to say to you that she's very sick, sir. She keeps calling for you over and over. All the time she's conscious, sir. They think if you came, maybe she'd have a chance. Go on, go on. Ain't a Virginia doctor left in Winchester. The Yankee doctors are too busy with their wounded and ours. If it ain't you, Dr. McGuire, then I guess it's nobody. Corporal. Yes, sir. Get some food in this man. Get him a blanket. I'm going to see General Jackson. You needn't apologize, Dr. McGuire. You didn't wake me. I don't sleep so good when I get whipped. Now, uh, what's the story about the girl? Well, she's... she's dying, General. You have my deepest sympathy, Doctor. But if she's dying, there's nothing you can do for her. I can get through the Yankee line, sir. And if I can get through, I can get back. General, I've got to see her. I must. You do not have my permission, Dr. McGuire. But, General, I, I told you... Very good, sir. You are excused, doctor. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. McGuire, I'm a man of flesh and blood just like you. This isn't an easy thing for me. I'm responsible for an army. In six days, we attack the Yankees. And if you are not with this army when it attacks, Confederate soldiers will die because of it. General, on my honor, I'll be back. I pledge my word. And what will you pledge the Yankee patrols? But, sir... Dr. McGuire... Are you a responsible officer, or are you a lovesick fool? Apparently, I didn't make myself clear to the general. The young lady's my sister. Oh. You love your sister very much? Is that so strange? No. Since she was a baby, she's always been fragile. And when she was little, I, I, I used to be with her a great deal, reading to her, just talking, doing things. And when you do things for someone and... It brings you closer. Dr. McGuire, to be born a human being is to be born a fool. I cannot grant you permission to go to Winchester. I can only tell you that in seven days we will attack the Yankees. Yes, sir. <laughs> His words said no, but he smiled. And that's all I needed. Between the place where Stonewall Jackson's army lay sleeping in the Virginia town of Winchester is no great distance. But when a hostile army stands between, distance has a new meaning. I rode for one full day and one long night, doubling my tracks through fields, 
skirt in every house, suspicious of every shadow. And always before me, the face of a sweet girl in pain. Perhaps it was fatigue. Perhaps it was carelessness. But less than an hour's ride from Winchester, I failed to see the Yankee sentry. Whoa, whoa, boy. Whoa, hold it. Whoa, boy. Guess this time looks like I got me an officer. All right, Johnny, hold your hands away from your body. Thanks, Johnny. Now, where are you from? Down the valley. Well, I guess that by myself. Where are you going? Winchester. Why don't you take the main road? This road is shorter. Oh, in a hurry, huh? Yes. All right, take your left hand. Reach under your coat and drop your gun in front of you. I'm not carrying a gun, Yankee. Well, it don't make sense, Captain. You're wearing a uniform. Gun generally goes with the uniform. Well, search me if you want to. Yeah, I want to. All right. Open that bag. Do it slow. Yes, sir. Hey, what's this? Surgeon's knives. You a doctor? Yes. My sister. She's in Winchester. She needs me. Sister, huh? What's the matter with her? Why, well, I can't say for sure, but she's dying. Oh, that's tough. They brought a message to me. They thought she might have a chance if I could get through to her. Hmm. You know, I got me a sister back home. Married, got 11 kids. Well, it was the tar out of them, same as she used to do to me. <laughs> Never met a woman who could hit harder than Bessie. Uh, Doc. Yes? Guess maybe I ain't seen you. Well, oh, I'm your... Right. Huh? I say I'm... I'm your prisoner, Yankee. I ain't seen you. But why you let me go? Oh, I don't know. Man's family is a man's family. Besides, I'm letting you ride in. Whether you can ride out is another question. Look, if you want to get to her in one piece, I advise you to wait for Doc and go careful. Between here and Winchester and... Quite a few of our boys marching up and down. Go easy, Doc. He wore a blue uniform. And mine was gray. We were enemies. And yet between us there was no anger, no violence, no hate. In Winchester there was a dying young woman he had never seen. And he was sending me to her. As though to someone dear to him. He warned me against his own comrade. <laughs> he should have warned me against those on my own side who spoke in accents of friendship like the man who suddenly stood before me. Looking for something, sir? I'm tired. So's the horse. We both need a place to rest for the next two hours. Two hours, sir? Yes. In two hours, it should be dark. If man didn't want to be seen... Especially in that uniform, darkness be most desirable. All right, sir? Being right isn't quite the same as being discreet. My deepest apologies. Sir, may I offer you a bed in my house? No, I don't think so. It's a good bed. You said you were tired. I just changed my mind. I have two brothers with General Lee here. You may trust me, sir, and you may trust my house. Well, I... I'll take your bag, sir. That's very, very kind of you, sir. Not at all. Lead your horse this way. I'll wake you in two hours. You would awake me in two hours. Good morning, sir. Why didn't you wake me? A most pleasant Virginia morning. A rare day. Where's my bag? Did you have a bag, sir? If you don't hand over my bag, I'll brain you with this chair. Put the chair down, sir. Neither the chair nor the house belong to me. I'd hate to mar them with a bullet. Put the chair down. That's better. Dr. McGuire... Who told you my name? You didn't, did you? <laughs> Mighty uncivil of you, sir. 
Dr. Hunter McGuire, surgeon in Stonewall Jackson's army. I found it written on a card in your bag. I guess I've been pretty stupid. I never contradict a gentleman. <laughs> it's a sad thing about wars, Doctor. <laughs> in some men, they bring out the hero, but alas, in other men, they bring out the scalawag. <laughs> Pure scalawag. You're pretty brazen, aren't you? <laughs> the best method of operation, sir. Hey, this is a fine bag, huh? Well, looks like now I'm in medical practice myself. Thank you for the bag and your horse. A pleasant walk to Winchester, Dr. McGuire. I cursed him and myself. He laughed and rode away. And yet... In all this, there was the hand of providence, because on horseback, I would have been taken many times, but on foot, and waiting again for night to fall and to hide me, I was able to slip into Winchester unseen. Oh, praise God. You've come, Dr. McGuire. How is she, Mrs. Johnson? Oh, I've been nearly crazy with worry. I thought she'd never get here. You and I both. Oh, come look at her. Good. Good, honey, it's me. Good. Did you hear me? The fever got worse during the night. She burns, doctor. She burns like a hot fire. Who is there to help? I'll call Miss Willis. Good, now listen carefully. Fill a tub with cold water. Cold, doctor? It's the only way to attack the fever, with cold baths. Ten minutes at a time every three hours. All right. And bind a cloth around her head. Pour cold water over it. Uh, Miss Willis can do that. Good, and while she's doing that... You and I will rub Gert's arms and legs. Her arms, her legs, her body. Well, I I'll go for Miss Willis. All right. Good. 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 Can you hear me? Wake up, Gert. It's me. Oh, Gert, try to hear me. I'm home. I've come back. I'm going to make you well. Baby, I'm going to make you well. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Robert Cummings, and sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. The year is 1862. A Confederate surgeon, Dr. Hunter McGuire, has made his way by stealth through the Union lines into the Virginia city of Winchester, where his sister lies desperately ill. A doctor's hand shouldn't tremble. But I was also her brother. Or flesh burned under my fingers. Her breath came hot and quick. On her face, there was a deceitful flush of high fever. Three o'clock, Doctor. You must be. She's worse. Burning. I, I have to be with her. We'll watch her. You can't watch, Fever. You've got to attack it. Wait a minute. Mrs. Johnson, back at the hotel, there used to be a house where they stored ice. Well, of course. It'll make the water good and cold. No, Mrs. Johnson. We'll apply the ice directly. Oh, but, Doctor, that... It's her last chance. We'll pack her in ice. There's nothing else left. <laughs> Miss Willis? Yes, Mrs. Johnson, as fast as I can. We lay the ice directly against her hot flesh. Then nothing remained to do except keep a vigil for a girl who was too young to die. Have you ever waited? Well, that's where the agony lies. The ordeal begins when nothing is left except to wait. And so... On the third day of my absence from the army, and the third night and the fourth morning, we waited for her to show, by some sign, that desire for life was still within her. Dr. McGuire, 
Oh, Dr. McGuire, she's awake. Dr. What? McGuire, she's very much awake. She's been napping, sir. Come here. <laughs> Darling, here's your brother. Hello. Hello. Remember me, monkey face? Mm-hmm. You always did like to scare me, didn't you? Mm-hmm. But you won't anymore. Doctor's orders. All right. Oh. Your hand's cool now, darling. Yesterday it was hot. Nice and cool now. That's good. Remember when you were little? You used to show me the tiny white marks on your fingernails. And you used to say that each white mark was some bad thing that you'd done. You called them your sin. Look, there aren't any now. You're going to be all right, Gert. Oh, you're going to be so all right. I'm hungry. I watched her drink a glass of milk, and then I kissed her goodbye. Four and a half days had passed, and in less than three days, an army of General Stonewall Jackson would return to battle. My army. And between them and me, the bayonets of 5,000 hostile Yankee soldiers. But in the streets of Winchester, it was no Yankee soldier who stopped me. Dr. McGuire. What? You, you must be mistaken. You're Gertrude McGuire's brother. You're wearing a uniform under that coat. No, lower your voice. The Yankee center is about. I need a doctor. I need a doctor bad. My boy's laying at home unconscious from a bullet in his head. Uh, I've got to get back to my regiment. He was shot when the Yankees took Winchester. You're the only one to help. Well, call one of the Yankee doctors. He was wounded in battle. They'll care for him. The care they give a prisoner of war? Well, they're good doctors, madam. They'll make him well. I hate Yankees. I'll let him die before one of them sets foot in my house. Well, you must be out of your mind. Maybe. Will you go to my boy? I can't. Now, goodbye. I've got to find a horse. I've got to get back to my regiment. If my boy dies, it'll be you who killed him. Oh, you're stark raving mad. If my boy dies, Dr. McGuire, you've killed him. How much do you want for this horse? Well, here's my... Don't take all day. A federal patrol could come by here at any minute. What do you want for this horse? If you go... You kill my son, Dr. McGuire. Who's she? What's she saying? Here's $30. It's more than the horse is worth. It's all I have. The Yankees shot my boy, and a Confederate doctor rides away. What about that? Are you a doctor? Oh, the woman's out of her mind with grief. Do you want the $30, or don't you? Speak up, man. 30 pieces of silver. Hand it over to him, Judas. His horse ain't for sale. Wait, wait a minute. I... If I don't get back to my camp, there... There are Virginia men who'll die for it. My boy is a Virginia man. Up in the attic of my house, he'll die too. I told you what to do. Call a Yankee doctor and your son has a chance to live. No, Yankee. Well, you're not a mother. You're a monster. My son will die. Very well, then. Your son will die. He's not the only mother's son who will. If you don't know your natural duty to your son, at least I know my duty to my men. Goodbye, Dr. McGuire. Madam. Yes? I tell you, you're beyond reason. You said so before. I pity you. Pity me. Despise me. Loathe me. But I give you no choice. When you go away, my son will die. I have no surgical instruments. My bag was stolen. Goodbye, Dr. McGuire. I can't. I can't think anymore. I can't remember anymore. All right. All right, mother. You may take me to your son. You can leave him now, Margaret. The doctor's come. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for watching him, Margaret. No more than neighbor. What is it, Dr. McGuire? Nasty. Bullets lodged in his head. Don't talk. Do something for him. 
There's nothing I can do. It needs a hospital. He stays here. Your son requires a major operation. I have no instruments. There are knives and candles in the kitchen. Carpenter's tools in the woodshed. I have needle and thread in my basket. You'll do what must be done, doctor. I'll get you what you need. What are you looking for? I need a large hook. There ain't any. All right, give me that fork. What will you do with it? Make a hook out of it. You're calm enough, I'll say that. I'm his mother. Nevertheless, I think you ought to go and sit in the parlor or lie down on your bed. I'm his mother. Well, very well. If you insist on staying, raise him. What for? I said raise him. I want him in a sitting position. All right. I'll hold him in my arms. He mustn't move. I'll hold him tight. I hold what's mine very tight. <laughs> Dr. McGuire, whenever you're ready. Is this enough bandage? What? No, no, we'll need much more quickly. Here, Dr. McGuire. This was my wedding dress. He's going to live, ain't he? I wouldn't have thought so. I certainly hope so. Here. I made a pad, same as father. Well, place it here. No, right here. A little more toward his ear. Oh. Over it. I press it down. You've got quick hands. And you've got nerve. Now turn his head toward you now. Not, not so much there. Pull him that way. You'd do it good. I've had experience, madam. Too much experience these past months. There. Now, that'll do it. Cover him warmly. I. He's my son. He'll be warm, Dr. McGuire. A horse for you, Dr. McGuire. He's spavined and blind and probably stolen. But I made the man give him to me. Well, how did you make him, ma'am? With the fear of the Lord and the threat of damnation by hellfire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not always crazy like this. I had a live husband before the Yankees shot him down. I have a live son now, won't I? Yes. I wouldn't have believed it. It was a fracture of the skull. I, I must leave at once, ma'am. I must get through the Yankee lines before another day breaks. There's a horse path through them trees. When you get to the cross path that goes to the valley, don't follow it. Keep up the mountain. Longer and harder. But there won't be any Yankee patrols on it. Only a miracle can keep me out of their hands. I saw one miracle today with my own eyes, didn't I? You get through. Goodbye, Dr. McGuire. The path was upward and across. The mountain was steep and strewn with rock. And the horse was old. And I was tired almost unto death. But the horse plodded on. And I remained upon the saddle, and with the blessing of the Lord of hosts, I, Hunter McGuire, surgeon in the army of General Stonewall Jackson, returned to my comrades on a day appointed for battle. Somehow I rode with them. Somehow I attended them when they needed me. And I praise God for that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Robert Cummings. Hunter McGuire, physician, surgeon, soldier. He is now a legend in the Valley of Virginia. In the years of peace that followed, his profession honored him 
as the president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Hunter McGuire. He lived his life in the highest tradition of his profession. Our thanks to Robert Cummings and our cavalcade players for tonight's story. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will present the distinguished star of stage and screen, Melvin Douglas. Our story tells of Nathan Strauss and his dramatic crusade, which resulted in saving hundreds of thousands of lives. Be sure to listen to Cavalcade next week and our star, Melvin Douglas. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by Morton Wishingrad from an original treatment by Arthur Gordon. Robert Cummings may soon be seen starring as George Petty in the Columbia release, Petty Girl. Music for our DuPont plays is composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program is directed by John Zoller. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the stage of the Belasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Next, here, Baby Snooks and Daddy on NBC.